Welcome everyone to uh, Foresight Intelligent Corporation Group. This is uh, one of our keynote meetings. And so uh, to give you some context, every first Thursday of the month, we have our keynote meetings, even though we have uh, many more meetings in between uh, because many of you are producing really amazing technology that um, we just wanna make sure that uh, there's a, some flow of that in the group. Uh, we have those monthly keynote meetings to really hone in uh, on the chapters that um, we, uh, we pop out. And so the chapters are always kind of like the red thread throughout um, that kind of like guide the whole program um, um, throughout the year. And so this is again, one of those meetings. And so again, we just released uh, a chapter that will be um, guiding us not only for uh, this meeting today, but that is also kind of the inspirations for the um, meetings in the following uh, two months. And so this is, um, I think, I guess, particularly in interesting months for you guys, because we really want your feedback. Um, and because many of you are working on the technologies that we're now getting to. Um, and so just to, uh, to kind of hit the ground running, I wanna maybe for 10 minutes or so, just tell you a little bit, uh, give you some context on where we are right now, um, and then we'll move to our presenters. Um, okay, so I will share my screen. So this is what you should see um, if you open up the um, book draft that we sent you. Um, and I think you should be able to have that in your, uh, you, you should have, um, yeah, you, you should have found that in your email. If not, I'll share it again in the chat um, or someone else can share the link that, that would also work. But basically in a nutshell, um, we have started this year uh, with chapter one, with the first meeting that was Mark, Christine and I just discussing, okay, why the hell are we having this group? Why the hell are we writing this book? Um, and giving a little bit of an introduction. And then in February, we had chapter two, which was on value diversity to voluntary cooperation. And you could say that was a little bit more of a topical basis for um, both the, uh, the group and for the book. And we basically said, hey, <laughs> values differ tremendously already in civilization. Uh, likely we won't converge anytime soon uh, on the one path to go. In fact, we see values drift a lot. So instead, maybe we should have a cooperative architecture and civilization as the thing to be striving for rather uh, than striving for um, uh, some kind of like alignment on uh, on the perfect value set. And so here we had Robin Hansen, we had um, Robert Axelrod uh, speak on political polarization. So really like a few fantastic speakers that drove the point home. And then in the last month, we had this open up the crazy bucket of, okay, where, how did we already get here in our default world of cooperation? Uh, what made uh, civilization so successful? And here we discussed a few drivers with Vernon Smith, we had Andrew McAfee, uh, we had Tyler Cohen, we had Balaji Srinivasan to just discuss kind of like how did we get here as a civilization um, and how is civilization already a super intelligence that is increasingly serving our interest. And we have discussed a few of those drivers such as property rights, um, different ways of writing more complex contracts, how they already allow us to cooperate across humans, across computing entities, and more and more across human and computing entities. So that many of you will know that from the Agoric papers still, but Basically, we arrived at, okay, we're doing pretty well. How can we um, further strengthen the uh, apparatus of, uh, of cooperation uh, moving along? And so now we're uh, arriving finally at the technology bit uh, that I think many of you have been waiting for. Uh, and so now we're trying to see, okay, now we have a few tools. We, have, we know a little bit about what we did right at civ civilization. How can we port those cooperative tools into a crypto commerce sector? And how can we not only emulate the tools that we already have, but how can we actually at use our new tools uh, from the crypto commerce sector to improve on the ways in which we cooperate. So this is what we're gonna do for the next two months. And so this is where we really, really want your help because that's the technologies that many of you are building. So um, to give you a little bit of kind of like just background of what to expect in this month, I made a comment here that we would really, really love your input. So if you comment something on the document, you're building technologies uh, that we really cannot have our tabs on. If you think that, any of the technologies really should be in there or um, you wanna perhaps propose a meeting on those, then uh, just comment there and I will reach out to you. Okay, so this is us soliciting feedback, feedback from all of you guys. You know that much better, it's your space. So basically what we say is, okay, let's port those, um, let's port those cooperative help we have into crypto commerce and we divide it up into three different layers. First, we have the internet layer that granted us an inalienable right to information with the second layer of cryptography that introduced monetary sovereignty in the form of cryptocurrencies. And now we're arriving slowly but surely in the crypto commerce within more and more an alienable right of contract. 
And um, we know in each of the layers, we kind of divide it into how did we get here and then what's possible. And the what's possible section is really where we want your help um, in just kind of like brainstorming a few um, bits in which innovators can start thinking about building the technology infrastructure of tomorrow. And so from the internet, we discuss, okay, how do we get from jurisdictions to the current internet? And then we just say, okay, well, even in the internet, we currently have pretty broken corporation brokers um, that uh, are again, um, re-emerging the same centralization dynamics. What can we do better here? And we discuss Xanadu, which many uh, people in this call have, have actively worked on as an inspiration here. Uh, we discuss different types of decentralized social media. For example, Chris Weber from Activity Pub will join us for a discussion on that. We are discussing uh, idea futures and prediction markets. We already had Robin on Future Key uh, join us here. Uh, but you know, there's many, many more that you are all working on. So please help us by commenting uh, so that we don't drop crucial ones. Second society layer is cryptography introducing monetary sovereignty, specifically in the form of cryptocurrencies. Again, we discuss how do we end up here? And then also very importantly, um, what specific function had, did cryptocurrencies uh, serve there? Um, and here again, many of you working in the space, please uh, add your examples, add your bits, add, add your use cases. This chapter is really trying to make a very active uh, and, and, and kind of like reality relevant use case for this. Um, and then we discuss what's possible. So currency is one of the institutions that we wanna um, make better, but there's many, many more. And so please help us collect examples here. We're really happy to have uh, Zuko present on zero knowledge proof in the next one. Uh, but you know, we also discuss blockchain-based property rights. We discuss how self-sovereign identity could potentially be used for decentralized health commons and how zero knowledge proofs could potentially be used for financial risk mitigation. Again, those are our first best guess guesses and you have better ideas, so please add your use cases. Um, and now we're finally arriving in uh, Open Society Layer 3, Crypto Commerce introducing an alienable right of contracts. And um, this is the one I think, uh, which is really fun and where we're gonna be spending much of our time in the next two months. We introduce different types of contracts. So templates, split contracts, video contracts, mixed contracts. And this is, I think, where we really, really want your help. We have seven uh, standing there right now, but there's many more different types of uh, complex, complex, complex contract arrangements that uh, we can come up with uh, that really drive home the kind of richness that we can recreate. And so again, here we have smart contracting templates that we start with, then we go into split contracts. So half pros, half automated contracts and why they are exciting. We particularly discuss the Amex information exchange, which many of you here again have worked on and contributed to as a particularly interesting example case. And it's a beautiful example. We discuss Zabo's video contracts and how they can inform legitimacy and we have Mark Stiegler today who um, co-authored The Digital Path. And so he will be discussing a little bit the idea of video backed split contracts for legitimate title transferability. And then we really quickly move on to, okay, what if we could use contracts not only between smart contracts pros, but could also add reputation in the mix as a new um, uh, technology of commitment uh, or as a very, very old technology of commitment. And then we have Alex Tabarok, uh, I think who's also here today on dominant assurance contracts who came up with it way, way, way before Kickstarter. Um, and so he'll be, he'll be discussing those and for what kinds of public goods we may be able to use them. If you have specific public goods, then let's just test out and see if we can, if there was a way to fund them with dominant assurance contracts. We'll have Glenn Whale come present and he's mentioned here uh, with quadratic funding. And then we have Anthony Aguirre's uh, anonymous assurance contract proposal for specifically for whistleblowing. Again, if you have specific use cases here, let's just try it out, see if we can prototype something. And finally, we arrive at DAOs. And this is really just seven, uh, seven ideas, but there could be many more. Uh, we have Maiden Fields, who's in uh, this group um, uh, with his DAO stack. And then uh, today we have Arthur. Uh, of course, you know, Jesus is much more than just uh, than, than just Staker DAO, but I'm hoping that perhaps you'll address that too. This is uh, where we mentioned um, where I mentioned Tezos as well on blockchain governance. So again, this is just an invitation from uh, me to all of you to please uh, let us know the technologies that you're working on. We don't know, and they're probably much more relevant than the ones that we uh, that that we were trying to, uh, to 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 grok by just looking at the work that you that we think you're doing. Um, okay, lovely. So this gives me a really good segue, but into introducing Arthur, uh, our first speaker. Um, and so thank you so so much for joining. I remember the first time I met you was actually uh, with uh, Zuko together. I think four or five years ago now in San Francisco. Uh, and it was really in the early days, uh, I think, of crypto. And we had a really wonderful 
uh, wonderful conference there. And, and uh, I mean, since then, really, Jesus has done a tremendous amount of work. And I think you're uh, really, I think, tackling at the at the most basic layer, I think, the problem of security holes and how, how to prevent uh, centralization or undue centralization. And so thank you so, so much um, uh, for, for doing that work and for uh, joining us here today to talk about it. We're super, super excited. And yeah, the stage is yours. Uh, and then afterwards, we'll go to Mark and uh, we'll collect questions in the chat. I'll be in the chat from now on for any of the questions that you have. After the whole meeting, I'll be on Gather if you guys have feedback on the book or on any of the technologies that you want us to include. Arthur, the stage is yours. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so I don't, I, I don't have slides, but I, do, uh, I, I prefer to, uh, to, to, to just present this uh, directly. I'm going to talk a little bit about governance and blockchains and why. I mean, I, why at least for a while, people think that they didn't really have anything to do with each other. I think that the idea of governance in, uh, uh, in, in blockchain and blockchain projects is now fairly mainstream, but when I first started working on it, it was, uh, it, it was very much not mainstream. So the first thing is why do people think that governance and blockchain don't really match? And, so, and, and also what is governance? My general uh, definition is that governance is a set of rules that you follow when you have a resource that needs to be shared by multiple people um, and you don't have a good way to divide it up. So the simple governance rule that I would say, the non-governance rule is property, right? And so, you know, if you own a, uh, if you own a piece of fruit and I, own a, uh, uh, and I own a piece of rock, then the governance is very easy. I have full control of my rock and you have full control of your piece of fruit and we don't need any governance because I can do whatever I want, you can do whatever you want. Um, that gets complicated when we have to have our shared resources and it would be great if we could privatize everything, but some things just can't easily be privatized. So a good example is, let's say you own a, uh, an apartment in an apartment building. That's great, it's your apartment. You can make holes in the wall to attach stuff. That's, that's, uh, you know, you, you, no one's going to bother you if you drill. Unfortunately, there is an elevator in that building and there's a heater in that building. And it's convenient to have a single heater for the building. It's more efficient than have one per unit. So someone needs to pay for that, uh, for that heater. And there needs to be some procedure for deciding how people are gonna pay for it. So typically you'll have some sort of homeowner association or condo association, and you'll have some rules about who gets to pay for it. Uh, I grew up in a building which for some reason didn't, the, the elevator didn't stop on the first floor. It's in France, so the first, it, it, it's um, zero based. So the first floor is the uh, second floor for uh, Americans here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there was always a debate of whether or not they should pay for the maintenance of the uh, elevator. Uh, so that's generally why you need governance rules. And when we are in the world of blockchain, especially if you're looking at you know, the first blockchain that, 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 that were created, like Bitcoin, um, you don't really think that you need governance because, well, Bitcoin is all about property rights. You know, I own a Bitcoin, you own a Bitcoin, you know, you do whatever you want with your Bitcoin, I do whatever I want with my Bitcoin. So why the heck do we need any governance here? You know, it's... Uh, uh, it's a separate thing. Oh, before I continue, how, how long do I have? Is it 10, 20 minutes I, so that I can pace myself? Well, 10 was the proposal, but if you take longer to make Okay, all right, I'll do it in 10 minutes. That's up to you. No worries, no worries, no worries. So, um, you know, why do we, you know, this is all about property rights. Why do we need any governance? But there is a form of governance in Bitcoin. There is, um, there are some shared resources and one of these is security. Everyone who's using, you know, everyone who's using Bitcoin needs to have the chain being secured. And the way that this is done in Bitcoin is with inflation. You have a block of CDs that's being created every single block, and that pays people to uh, to mine and, uh, and 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 secure the chain. So you have one um, minimal, very very limited, but it's still a form of governance. We all agree that our precious Bitcoins are going to be diluted by miners over time as they provide security. And you know, um, I speak about inflation. Well, sometimes people will say, "Well, Bitcoin only had twenty one million coin," but that's exactly a problem. This is actually um, if you look from an economic standpoint, once you reach 21 million coin, you are dependent on people making transactions on the chain to pay for the security, and now you're back with a free rider problem. It may be that uh, there's just so much usage that it's not a problem in practice. It may not be. We don't, we, we don't know for sure. But at least, you know, the subsidy model works. Uh, and for a while, this is the only thing that was considered and possibly the only commons that was considered to be part of a blockchain security. But you can think of many other comments for a blockchain. And one of these, for example, is uh, paying for the development of the chain. So I have Zuko here. So one example is a Zcash chain. And the Zcash chain in the first four years, uh, there was part of the block reward that went to the development team initially 
uh, build the software because having a team of cryptographer actually come together and write difficult cryptography is a comment. It's something that's useful for the chain. And so you decide that you are going to take a little bit of dilution. Uh, you take some of the budget that would have gone for security and you allock it to, uh, to, um, uh, to developers. So that's one option. There's other things. So um, there's a comment that I found very interesting, which is evolution of protocols. If you were looking, if you were in Bitcoin circles around, um, I would say 2012, 2014, a lot of people were talking about alternative designs, you know, uh, could be coin to things differently, could be going to get a form of privacy, could be coin, uh, get smart contract, could you, you know, could you use a proof of stake algorithm or all these different ideas. And then you were starting to see different points. And the general um, accepted principle was that, you know, fundamentally, this is just a ledger. You have an algorithm behind it. The algorithm is here to secure the ledger, but what it is, is a ledger. It's the only thing that matters. If you replace the ledger, um, then you know if you, you can replace the algorithm so long as you um, keep the ledger and it, and it keeps its identity. And you know, sure, there may be other experiments and maybe there's altcoins, but if they do anything that's ever worthwhile, we can take these ideas and, and put them into Bitcoin. And there's a bit of a gap here, which is that, okay, sure. So maybe you've identified a great idea. How do you actually move it inside your protocol? How do you actually change your protocol? Um, how do you coordinate around this? And that is not a, that, 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 that's not a trivial problem. Uh, and in the open source world, typically the, the, the form of governance that we've had in open source is forking. And so you have an open source code base. And since it's open source, in some sense, it's not scarce, right? Anyone can have a copy of their open source and have the right to work on it. So you don't really need governance in, in, in a sense. You know, you, you want to use uh, 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 X386. I want to use Xorg. So, you know, we, we, we fork the code and now we have like different versions and you can use whatever version you want. There's no problem. You know, there's no scarcity. You, you can work on either version. And if you use one version for a while and think it doesn't work out for you, you can use the other version. That doesn't work as well for things like cryptocurrencies because like we said, it's a ledger. So the problem is that if you fork your open source code base, you know, you have two code bases, which is fine, but now you have two ledgers and you don't want to have two ledgers. And typically because these things derive uh, almost the entirety of their value from network effects, um, what's going to happen is that one of them is typically going to win. And you might say, well, that's great. That's a free market at play. Uh, people are going to pick whichever one they want to use. Uh, they'll use this one. And so they'll get to decide. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is people are not going to pick the one they want to use. Uh, people are going to pick the one they expect other people are going to use. So the winner in a fork is going to be uh, the winner of a beauty contest. Uh, and you, you, you can look at, uh, and, and the winner of a beauty contest is going to be based on social expectations, and social expectations can be very circular. It can be based on very weird things like clouds, and it can be uh, sometimes determined by very, very small minority. It's not a very good procedure. So clearly, we need a governance procedure to, if, if, we, if we are to make any change, you know, one form of governance is to say, we're never going to change anything, ha, ha, ha. Uh, and that's been where most of uh, the Bitcoin thinking has been evolving. You know, it's just like it's set in stone. Bitcoin is not a ledger; it's a ledger plus an algorithm, and that's that. Uh, I, I, I shall say that you know this is not a, a point of view that's, that's shared by everyone in the Bitcoin space. You know, by all means, but it is. I, it, it feels like the dominant trait culturally. Um, and uh, the but 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 the other approach is that if you are going to have some change, I think it's important to have a governance procedure to decide on what the changes might be. Uh, how, are you gonna, how are you going to change it? If you want to change the insurance, how are you going to change it? So this is the basic idea behind Tezos, by the way, which is to have a governance procedure for upgrading your entire protocol, including your governance procedure itself. So it's fully, uh, it's fully introspective. So that, that's, that's a general principle behind governance. Uh, that's why it used to be uh, considered so weird, uh, because people looked at this as, well, these are purely property rights networks, so why do we need any governance? But there are, in fact, several commons that make it interesting enough that they, you know, that they, that they benefit from some form of, uh, uh, of governance in order to, um, to evolve. The, um, the other thing is that if you look at currency, uh, currency today, a lot of its stability comes from the fact that it's embedded in a web of contracts. So the stability of something like the US dollar, uh, it's, you know, there's a network effect, of course, is the fact that everyone values the US dollar, so it's valuable. But there's also the fact that your rent is in US dollars. So you need US dollar because that's what your rent is denominated in and you need to pay it. So when COVID crisis hits, a lot of people are gonna sell that, you know, a lot of people might say, hey, wait a second, I might lose my job. I may not have income. I'm going to need US dollars to pay my rent. So they're going to sell uh, other assets they have and they're gonna buy US dollars. 
Uh, likewise, you need to pay employees or you receive your salary. So being embedded into a web of contracts brings a lot of stability to a currency. And because cryptocurrencies are so very new, there are very, very few contracts today which are denominated in cryptocurrencies. But as that happens, forks become a lot more problematic because now all these contracts need to decide, well, which one is a canonical version of the ledger? You cannot just go willy-nilly and say, well, you know, we'll fork and people use whatever they want. Uh, and, 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 and in some sense, you know, the, 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 the dominant contracts are the people who can choose how these contracts are being, you know, where, where these contracts are going are going to have a lot of impact. You already see it in a network, for example, like Ethereum. So on Ethereum, you have a lot of financial contracts and USDC. And USDC is a big, big part of, uh, of, of all the trading going on in Ethereum. And, you know, if there's a fork, then basically um, Circle, uh, and I think it's a set of consortium around uh, USDC, is in a position to decide which fork they're going to accept redemption in. And if you're in a fork where the redemption is not accepted, then all of a sudden, all your contracts are broken. So this gives a lot of power to weird actors in if, you, if you're kind of going with this informal model of like, who picks up what. Anyway, that's about uh, 10 minutes, and that's my presentation of why governance is useful, especially if you want to ever change a protocol behind your, uh, 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 your blockchain. All right, next one up, we have Mark Stiegler. Um, Mark, I'm very, very happy uh, you were able to join. Um, I have to say that um, when, uh, when I announced this talk, I immediately got an email saying like, oh my God, I cannot believe it. You are have, uh, having the author of Gentle Seduction uh, I come and speak. And so <laughs> I think that, um, you know, in addition to uh, the many hats you're wearing, uh, one of is, is your fantastic work uh, with and on computers is also you are a really fantastic science fiction author. And um, I think Gentle Seduction is um, really uh, one of the uh, stories that I hold really dearest uh, in terms of long-term visions for the future. And uh, I think I'm not the only one. So uh, uh, so I'm, uh, anyone who doesn't know about that second head um, uh, of Marx, please go check out that story. All right, but now here uh, you are today here to discuss um, work that you've done with Mark Miller on the digital path uh, quite a while back uh, actually, and particularly to discuss video contracts and how they could be implemented with, uh, with smart or split contracts. Uh, to infer more legitimacy. Uh, and uh, I already saw your slides. You have quite a wild, uh, wild um, presentation and uh, you'll be discussing a few of your books too and uh, hoping to coax a few people into uh, a, smart coin, um, a smart coin endeavor here. So we have a lot to learn from your presentation. Thank you so, so much for joining. And uh, yeah, the stage is yours. Please go ahead. Yeah, okay, very good. I'm recording. Hang on a second. I've got bad news, everybody. Yes, I'm one of these people who does PowerPoint slides. So here we are. Uh, I was asked to talk about the digital path and the blockchain for title registries. Uh, everybody knows what a blockchain is, but I can hear you all cry, what is the digital path? The idea was originally invented by Mark Miller and he, it was described in an academic paper of the same name. Uh, you might ask, why am I presenting it then rather than Markham? And uh, the answer is in addition to being Markham's co-author, I also took it to the next level. In a, in a, uh, I used the digital path as the basis for a subplot in a series of science fiction novels. So in some sense, I'm the world's first implementer of the digital path, at least as a thought experiment. So the series takes place in an alternate future in which the American president for life expels all the immigrant engineers from Silicon Valley. These one percenter engineers and scientists move to a fleet of oversized cruise liners off the coast, giving birth to the last home of the creative human spirit, the brain trust. As you can see in the slide, more than one technology interesting to this group uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is present in the series, uh, in which one book is devoted to the global, a, a global pandemic. I wrote it back in uh, 2018. And the one book after that one is devoted to the global financial collapse that follows. 
Uh, anyway, a uh, little background is needed to make the digital path concept uh, meaningful. The name of the paper is a riff on the name of the book, The Other Path by Hernando de Soto, a remarkable Peruvian economist who realized that the poorest people in the world have trillions of dollars of assets. But because these assets, many of which are tied up in real estate, were not formally recognized by local corrupt governments, they could not be used as collateral for loans to make wealth generating investments. De Soto thought the solution was to go through the process of dragging those assets into the formal economy against all obstacles. Though these efforts were laborious and too often sabotaged by local officials, it was nonetheless a startling success. But it was still too slow and unreliable to truly advance human civilization. So Markham took the next step and proposed bypassing the local governments and enabling third world people to directly engage with actually trustworthy organizations from Western nations where such trustworthiness is so commonplace, we don't even see how radically it improves our lives. To establish the title rights of the people of a village using the cell phones that were not yet commonplace among poor people, though we predicted they would be, the villagers would video a shared agreement about who owned the different parcels and buildings in the area. Disputes would be adjudicated by mediators in America or Britain or Germany or any place with good institutions. With such international backing, we hoped that village properties could then be used for mortgages and other financial instruments to create a virtuous cycle of investment and the creation of even more goods that could be registered transnationally. Part of the proposed proposal used smart contracts to implement the exchanges of registered items, thereby removing even trustworthy human mediators from the equation as much as possible. The smart contracts, which would be computer programs with access rights, access to the rights being exchanged, would allow the title registry to do a transfer only when the preconditions for the transaction were completed. Smart contracts used to be almost impossible to write because of the security considerations. If a hacker could breach the contract, he could acquire all the assets under the contract's control. Fortunately, Agorix has developed object capability security programming languages that allow one to interstitch OCAP modules with few concerns that the resulting composition will be breachable. Perhaps the most important modularization Agorix has invented is offer safety. Using offer safety, even a 13-year-old can construct contracts safe enough to manage millions of dollars. And using this compositional safety means that the contracts can grow ever more sophisticated and cover ever more complex situations. In the brain trust, such contracts are hooked up to the outside world so that changes in external financial conditions can trigger the contracts to either exploit the unlikely opportunities or protect the contract holder from disasters. In the example on the slide, the smart contract uh, detects the global financial collapse initiated by the White House riot and adjusts the customer's portfolio. In this case, by shifting to smart coin denominated assets. This picture, by the way, is not true to the book. This is a photo from the real capital riot, not the brain trust White House riot. In a correct picture, the leader would be carrying a pitchfork, not a flag. Anyway, let's talk briefly about how this relates to blockchains. In the days when we were visualizing the digital path, the blockchain had not yet been invented. Once you have a blockchain, then of course it seems likely that that's where you would want to store the titles and the smart contracts using the blockchain to further minimize dependence on trusted third parties. Here's an example of how the digital path, smart contracts and the blockchain work together in the novel. A village in the small African nation of Benin uses a cell phone to create a video of socially agreed upon property lights, which is uploaded to the blockchain. 
Now all normal transactions and most disputes are resolved directly by the smart contracts stored along with the property titles. But once in a while a dispute arises that requires human intervention, at which point the resolution is kicked to a mediator who lives on the brain trust a few miles off the coast. When the mediator renders a decision, the enforcement of the result is typically fulfilled via social pressure from the local community. Now, when we wrote the paper, that was the only enforcement mechanism we envisioned. I thought at the time it was weak, but the success of the Grameen Bank in using social pressure to guarantee loan repayments suggests that this approach works better than I would have guessed. Anyway, in situations where this kind of enforcement fails in the novels, the mediator, <laughs> the mediator brings in uh, the elite Amazon women warriors who live in Benin and work with the Brain Trust. The story of the Amazons, most of which is real life history, is amusing but irrelevant. <laughs> I, will talk, I will end this talk with a short discussion of the blockchain and the digital path in the far future. But first, please indulge me for a short excursion into a different aspect of blockchains, namely cryptocurrency. For the Brain Trust, I worked with a cohort of economists and cryptocurrency engineers to create SmartCoin, which saves the world in book five. The special feature of SmartCoin is that it is specifically designed to flatten the Keynesian boom bust cycle found in primitive 20th and 21st century technological societies. The basic idea is to use the information available in the blockchain, notably the transaction velocities and transaction si sizes, to create and remove currency to maintain nominal prices. Uh, let's look at an example from, uh, from the book. Uh, here we see a rising and falling economy for a major nation. When the smart coin algorithm uh, sees a combination of falling transaction rates and falling transaction sizes, it infers that deflation has begun and prints currency, distributing it to the current currency holders. On the other hand, when it de detects uh, in increasing transaction rates and rising transaction sizes, it, in it, it infers we are facing inflation and sucks currency out of the system by auctioning zero coupon bonds, which it redeems the next time it detects deflation. Why am I telling you all about this? I mention it just in case someone out there might be interested in implementing this beast just to see how it works. If any of you are interested, please let me know. My last observation is about the issues with enforcement of the digital path into the far future. Other people will be talking in other presentations about distributing property rights for the planets and the stars to all the people of Earth. I have no idea where you could reasonably host such a title registry, except on a far advanced derivative of an interstellar blockchain. But the social pressure used for enforcement by the brain trust in Benin is not going to work across light years. And we're unlikely to have a proper legion of interstellar Amazons available to maintain property rights, though there are interesting science fiction stories in that approach. So how do we enable enforcement across the galaxies? To answer this, we must go back to 1951. If you haven't seen the black and white version of The Day the Earth Stood Still, by all means make the time. In the movie, the Gort robot enforces peace throughout the galaxy. Now, I've always had some heartburn when I thought about the underlying algorithms for a Gort-style robot because there are a lot of edge conditions and gray areas, some of which were explored by Isaac Asimov in his robot stories. Would a Gort really be possible? I couldn't for the life of me see how. Then about a decade after Markham introduced me to my contracting, and I spent that decade thinking about its relationship to Gort, I finally figured out what would work. 
Obviously, GORT is the physical enforcement component of an interstellar smart contracting system. As the module compositions and algorithms for smart contracts grow more sophisticated, GORT can handle more and more disputes on his own. And if a GORT runs into an edge condition, he just kicks it over to a mediator the same way they do on the brain trust. What could be more obvious? Anyway, thank you and Klaatu Barada Niktu.